So, once again, it's my very great pleasure to welcome people here to the Institute of Criminology. Uh, my name is Lorraine Gelsthorpe, and I'm director of the uh, Institute. But more importantly, today, um, I'm a member of the steering group uh, set up to organize the Bill McWilliams Memorial uh, Lectures. 21 years ago, a group of Bill's uh, friends, family, colleagues, uh, decided to establish the memorial lecture to honour Bill's memory. And as many of you know, Bill died in 1997 following a very prestigious career as a probation <coughs> practitioner, as a researcher, and as a writer. Uh, he's particularly known for a quartet of articles on the probation services development up to the point at which debates about punishment in the community began. Throughout his time at the Institute of Criminology, when I got to know Bill, he encouraged me to read Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, a source of his own inspiration for a series of writings on the uh, probation service. And essentially, After Virtue is a critique of modernity and of modern managerialism and its effect on morality. And uh, McIntyre argues that the tradition of virtues is at variance with central features of the modern economic order, and more especially, its individualism its acquisitiveness and its elevation of the values of the market to a central social space. It would detain me too long to say more here, but essentially McIntyre strives for a new moral order and one in which virtues or values, we might say, are at the heart of things. So the importance of virtues or values encourages a return to fundamental questions. What is criminal justice all about? What are we trying to do? What do we think we can do? What is the rationale for punishment? What principles and values inform sentencing and responses to people who are in conflict with, with the law? Well, Rob Canton, uh, our main speaker today poses such questions in his new book, Why Punish, and he will turn his attention to such issues in a moment. Following a very successful career as a probation practitioner, Rob Canton is Professor of Community and Criminal Justice uh, in the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences, the School of Social Sciences at De Montfort University in Leicester. He's produced several books, as well as over 40, 50 articles and chapters in books on matters ranging from social justice, human rights, and the values of probation, to the precarious rights of mentally disordered offenders, and censure, dialogues, and reparation, for example. Indeed, I think there's a parallel with Bill McWilliams, moving from practice to academia. But as with Bill, it was not a move to an ivory tower. Rather, uh, Rob has maintained engagement in concerns for real-world justice. I also want to add that it's about this time last year that Rob became just the fourth person from England and Wales to be made an honorary member of a very distinguished group, a distinguished European organization uh, dedicated to enhancing the work of probation. And Rob received the honor from the Confederation of European Probation, CEP, joining only 25 other people worldwide to get such a title in the organization's 36-year-old history. The CEP, which is based in the Netherlands, aims to promote the social inclusion of offenders through community sanctions and measures such as probation, uh, community service, mediation, and conciliation. And the nomination for, for that honor stated, you've done an, an, an astonishing amount during the long time that you've been involved with CEP, contributing to our work and conferences. You've played an invaluable role 
in developing the Council of Europe regulations and guidelines on community measures and the European probation rules. And I mentioned that because it signifies really the very valuable contribution that Rob has made to probation, uh, not only in the UK, uh, but in Europe too. So, Rob poses the question, why punish? In his most recent book, available from all good booksellers <laughs> and Amazon, <laughs> and why punish attempts to bring the somewhat rarefied reflections of philosophy to the practical problems faced by those responsible for framing policy and delivering policy, passing sentence and then putting criminal punishment uh, into effect. And the book argues that we could and should punish less without letting down <coughs> victims or endangering our society. So we look forward to hearing from you, uh, Rob. And I also want to introduce uh, Professor Nikki Padfield, uh, Omri QC, uh, who is from the Faculty of Law here in Cambridge. Uh, Nikki is Professor of Criminal and Penal Justice, closely involved with the work of the Institute, great friend of the Institute, sometime a judge, a recorder working in the uh, Crown Court. Um, she is uh, an international, <coughs> leading international researcher on matters relating to sentencing, uh, sentencing law, uh, socio-legal aspects of getting out of prison in particular, parole and issues relating to recall. And Nikki is also Master of Fitzwilliam College. So the deal this afternoon is Rob will talk for about 40 minutes. Nikki will offer a brief response to get us going. We collectively will then ask intelligent and thoughtful questions. <laughs> the steering group, the representative from the steering group, John Scott, will then say a final few words and then we'll all have tea. So welcome to Rob and welcome to Nikki and over to you Rob. Lorraine, thank you so much for such a warm and, uh, and generous introduction. Um, I really am very honoured to be here. Uh, as Lorraine mentioned, the very first Bill Williams Memorial Lecture took place uh, in 1998, and it was delivered by Professor Ken Pease, and it was delivered at De Montfort University. Um, I didn't work there in those days, uh, but I did attend that lecture. And although over the years I have missed some, uh, I've attended a great number, so I'm very proud to be the latest in a, a series of extremely thoughtful, wise-headed uh, people who have stood at this uh, podium in years gone by. I never met Bill. Many people who've given this lecture have begun by reflecting on their own recollections. Um, but I, although I didn't know him, I have met a number of people who knew him well. And recently, I have an, an anonymous informant, um, whose name is Jim, and is here. Um, <laughs> and this anonymous informant remembered him from Wilson House in the early 1970s. Wilson House was a probation office in the shadow of Nottingham Cathedral. Uh, a bit of a delinquent outfit they were at Wilson House. They did their own thing, but that was after Bill's time. And uh, my informant remembers him as a very supportive senior probation officer who invited uh, him to his and Brenda's home in Mapley on many occasions. And indeed, this informant used to walk the dog Rufus, about which there are so many hairy stories. Uh, Rufus would uh, sometimes attend the office and intimidate the uh, service users. Um, punishment in the community. Rufus sounds to me like a candidate for an offending behaviour programme um, with the greatest of respect. But anyway, that was one particular memory. And uh, my informant also recalls Bill as a, a smart dresser who took me out one lunchtime to buy some new trousers as he said I needed smartening up. <laughs> 
and I'm too diplomatic to comment on the extent to which Bill was successful in that particular project. Bill's scholarship had three particular hallmarks and Lorraine has already touched on them and I think they are models for us all and they are principles to which I've tried to emulate not as well as Bill but I've done my best and the first of these is his commitment to moral thinking about probation and about criminal justice more widely. Probation has always been an activity of moral and political significance. It's never just reducible to methods and claims about effectiveness, about what it can do. It's much more than the meeting of performance targets and even more than the most important instrumental objectives that it sets for itself, like reducing reoffending. <clears throat> A second hallmark of Bill's scholarship is his sensitivity to history, and again, Lorraine has touched upon this. His famous quartet uh, of articles that looked at uh, what was then known as social inquiry practice. And for me, the important thing in history is a reminder of the way in which things change and how the preoccupations of today weren't necessarily the preoccupations of earlier periods, and things may again change. Not things do change, they don't, uh, we shouldn't assume they'll persist. And perhaps the better we understand the past, the more we're able to influence the present and maybe contribute to a shaping of the future. And thirdly, and related to this, is Bill's recognition of the importance of reflection. Without reflection, we run the risk of simply hardening our practices so that they ossify into mere habits. Why do you do this? Well, it's what we've, we've always done. And that's a, a dangerous place to be when you are dealing with the, the lives of people, very vulnerable people, and doing uh, a practice which I've already characterized as politically and morally significant. So those are virtues that I think mark Bill's work and are among those that I've tried to keep in mind in my own work. Lorraine referred to uh, this book earlier. <clears throat> this came out, in fact, it's about one year old this week, I think. And among my reasons for trying to write this was a frustration that the search for a justification of punishment, which is one of the things that philosophers are always turning to, have become, has become rather abstract and remote. Lorraine aptly used the word rarefied. rarefied. The distance from the concerns of policymakers, sentences, and practitioners who have the responsibility of putting a court sentence into effect. So my feeling is strongly that the philosophy of punishment should try to raise standards of practice. It should, as well as thinking in these terms, and contribute towards making better decisions. And most books uh, on this topic, I think, don't really contribute in that way at all. They ask sharp and pertinent questions, but they don't really help us to do better practices than we do. And for this reason, the book includes a number of case examples to try to keep us anchored in a world of reality. And for this reason, I'm going to introduce to you a person who most of you have recognized. Many of you are involved in one way or another in criminal justice, and you have probably come across somebody rather like Rita. Rita's offered in the, in the um, book as uh, an example of someone who has a, a, a long record. She's described in court by the prosecution as a professional thief. We know that she's had a deeply troubled upbringing and a history of abusive relationships, particularly at the hands of men who have wanted to take advantage of her and exploit her in all kinds of ways. And indeed, on this occasion, the uh, prosecution and the defence, to some extent, though the defence is circumspect, the prosecution say that they believe that her partner has more to do with this offence than she's willing to disclose. And there's a suspicion that he bullies her, he's violent towards her, and may very well take away from her what it is that she's stolen. The pre-sentence re report comments on the high likelihood of further offending of this type. That will be based, as many of you will know, substantially on, on her record of previous convictions. Her rec record weighs a lot in uh, judgments about, about risk of that kind. And the report concludes by suggesting that a community order should be made. There should be some rehabilitation activity, a program to uh, enhance her thinking skills. And also the possibility of an electronically monitored curfew uh, is mooted in the report at the conclusion.
Now, in the book, I ask the reader to consider a number of things. For example, is a deficiency in her thinking skills the best way of understanding Rita's behaviour? What might be the consequence of confining her to her home at set times with her partner, given what we know about him? To what extent does her past explain her present conduct? Does it excuse or mitigate her present offending? I'd like you to keep Rita in mind, and I'll be returning to her from time to time as we proceed. Reasoning about punishment ought to help us how to approach defendants in her position, whether we're policy makers or sentences or practitioners, all trying to do the right thing. And any philosophical account of punishment that doesn't help us in that, you might wonder, well, what is it really for? I want to leave Rita in peace for a moment <clears throat> and just say that, uh, move on to say that in the book, I identify three kinds of ways of approaching the endlessly complex question, why punish? And the first of these is to reflect that societies have always punished people rather like Rita at all times and in almost all places. And the early part of the book tries to begin to engage with the terribly difficult question of why it is that human beings do this to one another. And those of you who've studied criminology at any level will be familiar <coughs> with some of the arguments. Do we do this in order to defend and uphold the social order? Does this give us an opportunity to affirm the values that make us a community rather than just a load of folk all living together? We want to say no, stealing is not what we do. Does it somehow express our own psychological needs and our insecurities? Does it speak to our emotions? I'm not going to say much more about that, but I think that it's an inescapable question. If we want to bring about change in penal practice, if we're engaged in penal reform at all, <clears throat> we need to have a conception of what an improvement would be like, what good reform is, what direction we should be moving in, but we also need to, want to understand better what the obstacles might be, what gets in the way of bringing about change that seems to many of us penal reformers to be so self-evident. Why are we punishing this way? We can do much better than that, but politically we know it's a great deal more complicated than that. And we need to understand better what those sources of resistance, and I think particularly the emotional and political salience of the phenomenon of punishment, a second way of approaching the question, why punish, is to talk about the purposes of punishment. I put it in inverted commas on this slide, because if you think about it, punishment hasn't got a purpose. It's not the kind of thing abstract nouns can't have purposes. It's better to talk about the purposes that people set for punishment. So the lawmaker may have a particular purpose, and the judge may have a particular purpose. People putting the sentence into effect, they may have other priorities and agendas, and of course the individual subject to punishment may be able to take some control of that and begin to try to work out what they might gain from and the sense that they make of the experiences they're undergoing. But in the political domain, these are three particular accounts of punishment that are often articulated. <clears throat> Sometimes they are considered to be so self-evident that people just take those for granted. And very often people will leap from anxieties about crime or concern about victims straight into uh, requirements for tougher punishments and so forth without making these explicit. And these three accounts are that punishment somehow <clears throat> makes us safer because it reduces crime, that it rights a wrong, because crimes are not only harms to be repaired, but they're wrongs in some way to be vindicated. We feel that some courses of action have been, are so reprehensible that even when there is nobody really to whom amends can fittingly be made, we need nevertheless to acknowledge that wrong. It's a, an unpunished wrong is somehow stays and hovers over us, maybe corrupts us. And in the book I give some examples of that being a a, a theme in, in a number of, uh, of cultures. And we also think that punishment is the way to honour the experience of victim, victims so that anyone who challenges these propositions are, is likely to be accused of saying, well, you're putting us at risk. If you reduce punishment, then we'll all be in more danger. Or maybe you think this isn't a wrong enough thing, you, you, um, and people will tell you at length about, have you any idea what a dreadful thing that this, this crime represented? <clears throat> 
and or and or some reforms let down let down the victim so many of you who've perhaps had arguments with people whose views may be different from your own about punishment may have encountered those who will tell you at length about the appalling experiences of victims and the heinous things that people have done all of which is true but from which it does not follow i think that we ought to uh, respond to that by enhancing the, the levels of punishment A big part of the book, probably most of the book, is concerned with the, what I've called in, the, in that title the ethical inquiry. How should we punish what's permissible, what's obliged to us? And the accounts that I've just set out of punishment are also part of those justifications because we all want to live in a safer society. Nobody wants to let down victims. So these are all legitimate political aspirations, but some of us doubt that punishment is the best way of achieving them. An aim is not the same as a justification, and I think in some texts those things are muddled up. So you might have an aim, but it doesn't follow at all that it is an ethically appropriate way of achieving it. But of course, if punishment cannot in fact achieve the purposes set for it, then that clearly undermines the justification. So if somebody says to you, well, the justification for punishment is deterrence, people will be frightened away from, from committing crimes. If punishment does no such thing, where does that justify what's left of that justification? It's had the rug pulled from underneath it. Jeremy Bentham <clears throat> said that with reducing reoffending, there are three ways of doing this. We can do it by taking away the physical power, taking away the desire, or by making someone afraid to offend. And in the literature, these are the familiar trio of incapacitation, rehabilitation, and deterrence. I'm not going to say much about deterrence and incapacitation, but I am so hostile to the idea of deterrence that I can't stand here without taking a swipe at it. When people talk about deterrence and about how that will make us all safer than we are, the first distinction that's been made by Anthony Bottoms and others is to distinguish between the seriousness of the crime and the likelihood of getting punished. If you think that you're not likely to get court, then why would you worry about the weight of the penalty? And I think that the evidence by now is pretty overwhelming that certainty, making it likelier that people will be caught, may deter some people from some things in some circumstances. But the weight of the penalty isn't going to make any additional um, benefit to that. I think it's psychologically naive and overgeneralized, and I think it works best for those who need it least. So the law may threaten me with all kinds of dire things uh, for doing things that I have no desire whatsoever to do. Um, it also, and I think this is, a, a, for me, another serious indictment, it doesn't give you any reason to refrain from bad behaviour. It just suggests that you don't get caught. Uh, it's a very self-centred and prudential way of looking at it. It's an abdication of what I believe is the ethical um, boundaries that should guide us in these decisions, and it gives no guidance at all for levels of sentencing. So you'll see in the newspapers, oh gosh, knife crime. Sentence at the moment is two years, let's make it three. You know, nobody thinks like that. Nobody reasons in that, in that particular way. So I think very often we just heap up stuff and do silly things out of the, um, the mistaken belief that deterrence uh, is going to, to, to help us here. I've even less to say about incapacitation, except to say that it may be that for the gravest offenders, there's a possibility that you, know, you could make a case for saying that some people at some time in their lives pose such a, a, a risk to the well-being of others that they need to be restrained from, from doing that. In the great majority of cases, we're talking much more about postponement than prevention. Earlier texts on incapacitation very often are preoccupied with the decision about whether or not to release somebody but we have developed, we know how to manage risk in the community much more efficiently than we used to. And sometimes I think the, the risk language can conceal the real resistance. And I'm going to take a, a risk here myself and say to you that when we have debates, for example, um, John Warboys, uh, Myra Hindley in earlier times, Colin Pitchfork, and people say, no, no, these people can't come out, they pose a danger to the public. We can have a debate about whether they do, but what's really animating the opposition is a disgust. These are people who are not fit to live among us because the behaviour that they have done is, is just so repellent, and I think that 
the language of risk is often a, a polite way of articulating um, a resistance, an opposition that is really comes from a quite different source. I know that's controversial and somebody may want to challenge me on it later. So having dealt with those in a very perfunctory and very unsatisfactory manner, I'd like to look in rehabilitation in a great deal more detail because rehabilitation is particularly associated with the work of probation to which many of us in this room are, are committed. And Fergus McNeil, who delivered this lecture just last year and wrote me a very nice message this morning to apologise for not attending this year, uh, wrote a, a tremendously interesting paper a couple of years ago in which he distinguished four forms of rehabilitation. And there they are set out. Correctional rehabilitation is what probation is often taken to specialise in. The opportunities for personal improvement, for maybe working with people in ways that begins to adjust the ways in which they think and with any luck also the ways in which they subsequently behave. It involves human capital, the development of their own potential and personal capacity and in modern forms with an encouraging, increasingly encouraging emphasis on centering on their strengths and their aspirations to lead what would be for them a good life, a life in which offending no longer has any place. Separate from that is legal rehabilitation. I'm going to come back to all of these, by the way, so I'll just trot through these now. Social rehabilitation and then moral rehabilitation. And I don't know what that involves. And I'm going to say a little bit more about it, but be interested in your views about what that amounts to. So first of all, correctional rehabilitation. And some of the older books about um, the purposes and uh, priorities of punishment, the ethics of punishment, are concerned with this correctional rehabilitation. And there have been times when it's been closely associated with an idea that maybe people who commit crimes have something in their past or something in their head that needs some sort of tweaking or adjustment, that they need to, their thinking needs to be varied in, in, in some way. How we do that, I think, seems to me to make the whole difference. And Christopher Bennett sorts out that if we want to take what's right as the prior question before we look at what works. We need to look at what it is we're trying to do, how we do it, the role of consent and compulsion, and its relationship to fair punishment. So trying to change people's attitudes and behaviour for the sake of a wider public good without regard to the individual's own interests and participation in that process is something that we might want to call into question. And I hope that most of us would be profoundly uncomfortable and want to rule out deception, manipulation, or excessively intrusive techniques. Legal rehabilitation is, is quite distinct. This is the sense of the word rehabilitation. And in fact, Bill McWilliams wrote a very good paper on this um, with, if I'm not mistaken, Ken Pease on the, the topic about how there's an even earlier of uh, sense of rehabilitation, which doesn't mean changing people. It's really to do with restoring people to their citizens' rights after the fulfilment of the proper sentence. And this is the sense of the word that is to be found in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. Whether you are affected and whether you can benefit from the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act doesn't depend on any changes that may have taken place in your head or in your conduct. It simply depends on the amount of time that has passed since you committed an, an offence. And at times, this, recent times, I think there has been some, some real progress uh, in this. I, in my little world, and we never know, do we, whether we're picking up on the, the, the changes in broader social trends, but I think there is certainly some momentum towards improvement um, in this. So this notion of banning the box. So you shouldn't ask people at the point of application. You should judge people on the merits of their application and then maybe take up the question in a character reference if you have found that they're the best person to do, do the job. So this box that appears on a many application forms, and as you can, the giveaway here is the word offence, spelt with an S, which betrays that this comes from the United States. So the ban the box campaign is particularly associated with that country. But there's been, here's another more heartening headline that the High Court has ruled that in certain circumstances, some kinds of criminal record doesn't, don't have to be uh, disclosed to potential employers. 
And just to go off script for a moment, I have to mention that my the football team that I have the uh, variable fortune to follow, Nottingham Forest, has recently gone into partnership with an organisation called Clean Sheet, which is committed to precisely um, this. And let's hope that some of the clean sheet uh, aspirations can rub off on the performance of the team. Um, <laughs> But this is still around, and here we have Chris Stacey, who's done some excellent work. Here are a couple of tweets that he's, uh, he's uh, through to our attention on Twitter. A conviction of mine from when I was 18 followed me my entire career. Here's someone who is 59, and it's held against that person pretty much their entire life. And here, my student recently attempted suicide. She doesn't see a future with her childhood criminal record. She's now 40 in her records are very minor. I thought there was a glimmer of hope after all the TV courage and the recommendations. So we are a long way from being able to achieve what some of us would like to achieve in terms of legal rehabilitation. Social rehabilitation is another thing again. It may be that there is no legal obstacle to people taking up some of the resources that they might need in order to live the kind of life that would help them not to become involved in crime. And here, this is a very, very well-known list. Many of you will have come across this before. Um, legal rehabilitation doesn't guarantee fair access to all of those things by any means. People who've been in prison face all kinds of additional obstacles that might interfere with that. And again, I spend too much time on Twitter, but those of you who follow Twitter and other forms of social media may have seen something this week where one of the states in the United States of America has come up with a bright idea that they won't be allowing people to have access to food stamps uh, if their families have got a, a criminal record. Well, what a spiteful and, and self-defeating uh, strategy that seems to me to be. So anyway, social rehabilitation, I think what that amounts to is self-evident. Nobody's asking here for special favours, but to, for people to have fair access to the resources of civil society that everybody else is supposed to be able to enjoy. Tricky thing, by the way, in other countries. Lorraine was good enough to mention my work in other countries. It can be quite difficult to go to a country and say, your prisoners in your prison, they don't have a nutritious diet. And you get laughed at this. Well, half the population don't have that. So, you know, anyway, that's a bit off, off, the, off the script. Moral rehabilitation. I asked earlier about, about what that might amount to. So you can imagine, can't you? This is distinct. You might have someone who's committed herself to personal change, the correctional thing, found due legal recognition, lack recognition, the law isn't an obstacle. She may have full and fair access to the resources of civil society, but still be viewed with suspicion or active mistrust. Because that burden is one that many people, I think, can carry for a very, very long time. The gaining of trust, I think, is central here. And judgments of character can be exceptionally difficult to change. So in some sense, I think this form of rehabilitation can be the hardest to achieve. I think it entails remorse. If somebody is, say, is, is not in any sense repudiating or retreating from the conduct that caused such uh, their convictions in the first place, it's difficult to think about them having been somehow reconciled uh, with the rest of their community. And maybe... Saying sorry is just too easy. Maybe there are other things that they need to do, some way of making active amends, and maybe we need to have some settled and consistent law-abiding behaviour before we can begin to move towards a different way in which we respond towards them. But we have to accept that that change is possible. And for civil society here, this is not just about forbearance. It involves active duties and responsibilities to enable those things to take place. And Linda Radzik, who's written a very good book called Making Amends, she puts it like this, we need some way of talking about an end state, a point at which we can describe the wrongful act as being, having been successfully resolved. I don't like the word closure, but I, it's something like that that I think she's talking about. That's finished, that's complete. 
And I've sometimes wondered whether rather than talking about a, a philosophy of punishment, we would do better to talk about a philosophy of responding to, to wrongdoing, which would incorporate not just the imposition of a just punishment, a just sentence, but actually the duties that we all have to bring about some sort of meaningful reconciliation. So there's some kind of, of conclusion and a restoration to previous standing. So Rita has been waiting patiently for us and maybe I can now apply some of this. How do the philosophies of punishment that we've been looking at help us at all to think well or differently about Rita? What would rehabilitation in any and all of its forms be, be like for Rita? Do we think that we need to improve her thinking skills? Do we think that's a priority as legal rehabilitation? Sorry, as correctional rehabilitation would encourage us to think. What might the contribution be of the criminal justice system in general? Can they contribute much to bringing about, uh, to, to responding in a, a just and proper manner to, to Rita? And might some interventions make things worse? So those are some questions we may want to return to, but, but to park for now. Generally, the idea that punishment makes us safer, I think people have commented on very well. David Garland here, there's a long quotation, so if you'll bear with me, I will read it, just or skip through it. It's only the mainstream, mainstream processes of socialization, or the things he puts in brackets. These are the things that can promote proper conduct on a consistent and regular basis. Punishment's never going to succeed to any great degree because the conditions which do most to induce, induce conformity lie outside the jurisdiction of penal institutions. So choosing your parents with care being well brought up, having a good education, having access to job opportunities and all those things that make for a rich and fulfilling life are nothing to do with criminal justice. And if we think that they are, we'll end up, as Hyman Gross nicely put it, we're tempted to adopt barbarous measures out of disappointment or foolish ones out of despair simply because we fail to achieve what we've no right to hope for in the first place. And I think punishment does have its perils. If we, it's bad for a society to get over-enthusiastic about punishment in all kinds of ways. It undermines other mechanisms. Good societies depend upon trust, a sense of reciprocity and dignity and mutual respect. These are things that have a sound ethical foundation, and they do much more than the institutions and practices of punishment to reduce crime and bad behaviour. That's what I'd like to say about the story that punishment makes us safer. But of course, that's just one of the stories, and there are two others. And one of these is that we need somehow to acknowledge and respect the wrongdoer in the process of righting the wrong. And when people come to work out what is a fair punishment for the, uh, the wrong that has been done, they often think about harm, they think about culpability and they think about the impact of the offence and a lot of this has been crystallizes around the idea of censure if someone in any group has, has done wrong we feel it's important and respectful to communicate to them that what they have done is a wrong thing somehow how you do that is another matter but but it, but it, it needs that kind of acknowledgement and some philosophers of punishment would say that the sole value of hard treatment, all the stern stuff, the burdensome stuff that we do to offenders, its sole value is that it is the best way to communicate the censure, which is essential. But Lode Walgrave has argued that the punishment that we have at the moment, prisons and things like that, are communicatively arid. They don't actually convey that very well at all. So it's all very well to say that, yes, we need to have a communication, but the communications that we convey are blunt, inept, and sometimes oppressive. And Anthony Duff has urged, by contrast, the potential of community sanctions, which, of course, has implications for the way in which probation goes about its work. Let's again apply that to Rita. How much harm do we think that Rita has done? How, how culpable is she? What would be the impact of the sentence that we're planning for her? The impact, by the way, of an electronic monitoring curfew requirement on Rob Canton would be minimal, given my preference for turning in very early at night. Um, the impact on, on in a safe household where the 
greatest source of danger is probably an irascible cat. In a, another household, to be pinned in and prevented from doing, you know, this is a burdensome thing, and we are putting Rita at risk, maybe by confining her to houses with a petulant bully uh, of, um, of a boyfriend. And I should have said, I lost one of my best lines blasted, so I'm going to go back and just say, if we're talking about deterrence, do we really want to enter into an arms race of intimidation with a violent bully to see who can frighten Rita more? Is that a proper way? Never mind the consequences of that, the effectiveness. Is that something that we want to do as a society, or does that actually rather shame us? Should we expect her to be remorseful? What forms of punishment would best communicate the censure that we might want to communicate? And if censure is more than scolding, what might Rita want to say back to us? Because some people have built upon ideas of censure to talk about the idea of dialogue and communication. And I think there's something important embedded in that. The emotional is something I've already touched upon. And I don't think that we can understand punishment or begin to realise how we might change attitudes and practices of punishment without a sufficient understanding of emotion. And someone who isn't in the book, only because I didn't come across her work until I had finished the book, is the excellent scholar Martha Nussbaum, and she argues that the desire for revenge, the repayment of harm for harm, is most typically fueled by anger. And if you read newspapers and the comments that people put up in response to awful cases, anger is absolutely salient, isn't it? It's really prominent. But she goes further, and I think really interestingly, by saying that anger entails a wish for payback. So that if you are angry, but you have no wish for payback whatsoever... The emotion that you are feeling is probably not anger at all, but something much closer to grief. And we live in a society in which blaming and punishing the wrongdoer brings about what Nussbaum argues is a wholly illusory sense of control. A response to grief and appalling things that have happened is often a sense of helplessness and we feel as if somehow we are, we are able to do something if we can get cross enough, if we can indulge in blame and if we can indulge in punishment. And Martha Nussbaum goes so far as to say that anger is always normatively flawed. It's often incoherent, based on bad values and especially poisonous when people use it to deflect attention from real problems that they feel powerless to solve. And we might think of some famous cases in which some people have taken have been encouraged by the newspapers to continue to fuel their anger and have been unable to grieve and have never been able to, to get past that appalling frustration. Um, and it's particularly ironic that the newspapers who encourage this are very often purport to be their champions. <clears throat> now, Martha Nussbaum would say that although anger is never justifiable, and isn't that an interesting proposition, anger is never justifiable, read her book but it is often well grounded and by well grounded she means that it's directed at the right person who has indeed done a, a, a wrong thing and it's they who are responsible for that but it's trans what she urges is a transition we begin by saying this is outrageous someone must pay but move towards saying instead this is outrageous it mustn't happen again that becomes the priority and as it says at the bottom of the slide, there are a number of scholars who found that this is a quite a common trajectory in restorative justice encounters. People who have been victims of crime are initially very hostile, very angry, but as the conference proceeds and as there begins to open up a degree of dialogue, then they begin to focus on the priority of it not happening again. So what at the moment we think we should do if by honouring victims we feel outrage on their behalf. We feel a sense of shock. What's happened is enormous and it's dreadful. We then translate that into anger and our anger gives expression to retribution. But there are at least two other paths that we could follow if we choose. And one of them is to translate that outrage into a robust determination to prevent any kind of recurrence. So that's another option. 
But a third option is also, as victim support movements do, is to turn our outrage into compassion and channel that into supporting the victim. And the single most important thing to notice here, I think, is that there are three issues and not just one. Giving somebody whatever we take to be their just desserts, trying to bring it about that things like this happen less often in the future, and offering help to the victim, they may be bound up, and restorative justice sometimes seeks to bind them up, but nevertheless, they're conceptually distinct. And in particular, particular, they're not all well achieved or vindicated by anger and weighty punishment. And it's terribly important to, to recognise that the outrage is no less. We shouldn't have to compromise our feeling and, and somehow say, well, what happened to this person is not so very bad. We should look that badness in the face and refuse to follow the consequence that is often uh, taken to follow from it. And as I've said already, in many cultures, victims are encouraged to be angry and we join them in the anger and we talk up their anger and sometimes it can block grieving and prolong and aggravate the pains of the crime. It can also prevent us from learning from dreadful crimes and distract attention from the specific needs and interests of victims. For that matter, stern punishment often fails to bring the anticipated satisfaction. There's some interesting psychological research about this. But it's not the case that victims who think, oh, you know, I really want my, the person who did this to, to get their comeuppance. And if that happens, it's not the case that they say, oh, that's fine, and, you know, I feel okay with that now. That doesn't always and necessarily work. So we need, I think, to find and seek better ways, seek and find the better ways of achieving the end. And I rather like this quotation, which is, comes from a novel by a man called Nathan Filer. People will come on the television and say, this happened and this was a sentence. What kind of punishment is that? You know, this, that's just not enough. And I do feel with Nathan Filer that some things are just too big and that an attempt to try to come up with a punishment that would be so dr dr dreadful that it could somehow reflect the enormity of the crime is forlorn because we won't achieve it. And if we could, we probably shouldn't because it would involve us behaving in a similarly barbarous and cruel way, way that we are um, attributing to the offender. The rights of victims are not best affirmed by weighty punishment and we shouldn't articulate them in opposition to the rights of offenders. The current Mayor of London, when he was um, a Member of Parliament, and uh, uh, he said that if you give prisoners the vote, it would be a slap in the face of victims. No, it wouldn't. And we shouldn't forget that offenders are a highly victimised group. Uh, Baroness Corsten attributed this particularly to women offenders, and you might think about uh, Rita's experiences here. You might also recall the work of our friend Gwyneth Boswell, who is unable to be here today, but is a staunch supporter of the McWilliams uh, project, who drew attention uh, years ago to the fact that very many young people um, convicted of grave crimes have an awfully abused and traumatic past. So some people like myself might be tempted to say, well, of course, I'm a probation officer. I was a probation officer for many years. I never worked with victims. It's just not true. Um, many of the offenders that we work with are certainly have been victims of, of dreadful crimes. And if you were feeling, particularly if this isn't a, a step too far, you have sometimes people encouraging probation officers to raise victim awareness when they themselves have not been uh, victims of anything very much, but the people whose awareness they're trying to raise have probably been the victims of, of some pretty horrible things. So victims and offenders, you can apply those terms if you wish to particular crimes, but they're not permanent standings. They're not sort of separate tribes, goodies and baddies. And the rhetorical contrast between them, such that the more for one, the less for the other, is profoundly unhelpful. And that way of thinking and talking about it hinders the reintegration of people with convictions and the development of strategies for supporting victims. What I think we must try to do is to transcend any assumption that the interests of victims and offenders are inherently opposed and seek resolutions that satisfy the legitimate interests of both. Where does this leave probation? Well, I think probation, and these are early thinking about this, and, and Tony Bottoms has helped me to think about it better, but I'm still a long way from understanding it. But I think that censure theory is about has focused too much at the moment on the pronouncement of sentence. 
and has paid insufficient attention to the way in which it's put into effect, how it's implemented. But of course, the way in which a sentence is implemented is also a communication. So a court might say to somebody, you need to take more responsibility for what you do. But then they bung them in a prison where they can take very little responsibility for what they do. Their life is wholly organised for them. So the, in a way, the manner of implementation undercuts the, the, the message of, of the censure. And we need to think instead, I think, much more about the end state and what that would be and how it might be reached. I think probation could be understood as representing the community and its values. Enforcing the court's order is the censure. There's a lovely expression that I associate, I think, with Mark Drakeford and Morris Vanston, who talked about probation at being at risk sometimes of becoming a bastardised form of moral scolding. People don't come to probation to be scolded. It's the implementation, the holding people to account to the order of the court. That is what constitutes the censure and what constitutes the punishment. But censure of the crime is not the only message to convey. And there will be other things, perhaps, that we might want to convey to Rita. We might want to convey a degree of compassion and understanding and we can do that without any attempt um, to collude uh, with the crime or in any way approve of her stealing, which is probably a bad thing for, for her and, and for everybody else. And we need to attend to the messages that Rita might want to give back to the community whose values she's taken to have flouted. If we don't pay that attention, respectful her attention to her own perceptions, there is a significant risk of co our colluding with social injustice. Isn't it a shame that we haven't got the benefit of Bill's insights into desistance? Desistance is now a very topical subject in criminology, but it wasn't one that Bill particularly spoke about. It's become much more prominent in, in more recent years. But what Bill and Tony did write about in one of their most influential papers was a non-treatment paradigm, repudiating some of the suspiciously intrusive rehabilitative therapies that people mistrusted at that time and offering helping as the foreground of what probation should do. And if you think in terms of probation as helping, you help people to do something that they are in charge of. They're, they're in the forefront. And this includes an awareness of the obstacles and a commitment to trying to help them to overcome them. And as I've tried to insist earlier, social and moral rehabilitation involve the active participation of civil society and not merely, but also, its forbearance. We have duties towards people with convictions and not just rights against them. If we take seriously this concept of a moral community, which many philosophers of punishment advance, then clearly we have obligations and not the obligations don't simply rest with them, however unfashionable it might be. And as Nicola Lacey, I think, puts it rather, rather splendidly, we need to try to respond effectively and even-handedly to the harms and rights violations represented by criminal conduct without resorting to measures which in effect negate the democratic membership and entitlements of offenders. That's my last slide. Thank you so much for listening to me. standing here because I don't want to get in the way of your intelligent responses. I feel I'm some kind of in intervening moment just while you gather your thoughts. So please li live with your thoughts and don't necessarily listen to mine at this moment. I have to say that I love the talk because you're saying what I want to hear. Um, I often say to students that I live in a triangle of which the points are theory, law and practice and Rob and you and Bill McWilliams all live I think in a similar sort of world in many ways, one which is influenced by 
theory, but is very much grounded in the real world. And clearly you've been much affected, Rob, by your work as a probation officer, your awareness of the vicissitudes of life by um, your common humanity, which makes you respond rather differently to many traditional theoretical philosophers. I have to say that I think this book is a great read. If I'm standing up here just to try and sell the book, I'll happily try and sell the book. I think it's a fabulous read, and I think it's interesting to think about who should read it. Certainly all students should read it. It's on, I hope, our summer reading for students, if they ever read anything halfway serious in the summer. But um, has the Minister of Justice read it? Well, perhaps I should just send him a copy and see whether he will. As you know, like the talk which was... Um, a great think piece. Rob doesn't just write philosophy. He wants what he calls a normative action guiding philosophy of punishment, which helps us say why we should punish in this way for these reasons. And he's given us, I think, a really powerful message that there isn't a single overriding rationale for punishment. But overall, as he ended there, we've got to recognize our duties towards people who have criminal convictions. Why on earth do we do what we do today? And can our punishment system, if you can possibly call it a system, truly be justified? So, of course, Rob says, we can't have make an ethical appraisal of punishment without studying the reality of how sentences are put into effect. He's surely absolutely right that too much philosophy has become distanced from the reality of day-to-day -day life. To me, a really interesting message is that he wants to raise ethical standards in <coughs> sentencing practice. First, don't focus just on the pronouncement of sentences. That has to be very important, that the implementation of sentences is crucial. And indeed, in the book, he says it's a message which is likely only to be heard by the offender. Well, I think judges have to think through much more about the implementation, the implications of their sentences when they impose them. And the second thing I think that Rob said, which was very relevant to judges and magistrates, is to do with their training. He gave a very clear message, I think, talking about Rita. The questions that he asked about Rita is that, judges, you should think about the ethics, the morality of what it is you're about to do to somebody. You've got to ask these sorts of questions and not the step-by-step -step clinical process that they are encouraged to focus on. So in an age where it's so difficult to bring down the prison population, I have to say that if I was the Minister of Justice, I would definitely have a key performance target to reduce the population, prison population to, let's say, 40,000, half of what it is today. And I'm not at all convinced that our current sentencing guidelines do that. Again, as Rob says in his book, a penal tariff can generate into, did generate into nothing less than habit. Judges get into bad habits, and these ethical questions are really interesting to shake us out, I think, of our bad habits. I might tease Rob a little bit that he was a bit unoriginal in the title of his book, which he stole from um, one of my other heroes, but it would only be teasing because actually he pays due um, respect in his book to all the heroes on whose work he builds. Um, I deliberately slip in a mention of Nigel Walker, but of course today's lecture is to commemorate the memory of Bill McWilliam, and he so clearly also is a man who combined this really scholarly approach with moral conviction, with a sense of purpose. So the essence of Rob's thesis, I think, his talk today and indeed this book, is a critique of traditional philosophy. It ignores the often unintended, unwanted consequences of punishment, imprisonment, of course, damages not only individuals, but also their families, communities, and indeed 
all of us. It decreases people's social, economic inclusion. It rarely helps people build human capital. And we've got to think about what punishing better really means. How do you punish better? It's difficult to know what better punishment looks like. I like a message that you give, Rob, which tells people who work in prisons, people who work in probation, that their primary duty is to work towards the betterment of ex-offenders. And we have to recognise that so much punishment undermines other reintegrative, rehabilitative mechanisms. You mentioned trust today, or sense of moral responsibility, dignity, social justice. Rob is, of course, absolutely right to criticise the way that criminal justice policy often backfires. Again, in the book, I think he goes a bit further than he went today. He goes so far as to conclude that the realisation of policy aspirations in practice is, perhaps even more than in any other area of public policy, altogether unpredictable. Wow, that's quite something. So what is the answer? For Rob, I think it's locating criminal policy within the domain of wider social policy. I hadn't worked out till today that you actually worked in a faculty of health. Um, I think I'll suggest in this university that we move the law faculty into a faculty of health. It'd be a brilliant place to have a law faculty. So that's great. Penal policy, of course, shouldn't be a discrete area detached from understanding how people really live their lives. But I think reality is a lot more depressing than even you recognise, Rob, and I thought I would just wave in front of you, not to tell you that I waste paper by printing things or that I've read things that lots of us haven't yet read. The Justice Committee this week, in its latest paper on transforming rehabilitation, it's a fantastic indictment of current probation practice. And I think it's really depressing that we rely on a committee of MPs to point out the blindingly obvious that Rob was pointing out, and people go on pointing out, that problems for released offenders include homelessness, shortage of money, ill health, poor supervision and support. I'm really intrigued by your outrage and your anger. I'm not an expert on those concepts, and I, we all have to worry about it in our working worlds. Should I focus more on the meaning of Section 32 of the Criminal Justice, or should I act, or should I actually go away and read a book on anger and outrage? You know, should we be broad in our scholarship, or should we be the world ex expert on very narrow things? Um, I think broad is probably beautiful. But I do wonder what we should be doing with our outrage and our anger. You've got to do more than just locate criminal policy within wider social policy. You've got to fund it properly. You've got to organise it properly. And how we move things on, I honestly don't know. It was a great lecture. It's a great book. I think that we do all have to think about it. It's inspirational, I think, to be reminded that we must restore into our thinking the individuality of offenders, which is what sentence and guidelines are taking out in many ways. We've got to get meaning and context into thinking about what we do with offenders. Of course, we've got punitive excess all those liberals in this room will agree on that. Not everybody will agree, and you said very interesting things, of course, about the role of newspapers in fueling anger. But cultivating empathy, it was interesting you didn't have empathy on your list of buzzwords to think about. Again, I'm not an expert there. The bottom line, I think, is that we've got to do a bit more, all of us, to rise to the challenge that you point out. Your challenge is perhaps particularly for academics, but also practitioners, to think about how they engage with the real world, how you actually make the world a better place or seek 
to do so. I think that um, it's inspirational. Thank you very much for provoking us. It'll be really interesting whether the questions are on philosophy of punishment or how you integrate philosophy of punishment into that common humanity which you seek to espouse. But let me thank you and indeed the organisers of this lecture series for making us all, I think, think considerably harder than it's often easier not to think very hard. Thank you.